we uh, have been infected with the idea of um, original sin, and this is part of the, what keeps us infantile. We actually believe, I think, every single one of us at some level, that we are flawed, unfit. And this is paralyzing because uh, if we start talking about redesigning human nature, people say, oh, wow, you know, this is what Hitler was talking about. As soon as you start redefining human nature, you redefine it worse. The beast returns. It means, you know, we have no faith whatsoever and we believe, you know, that the given situation is the best of all possible worlds, is what that's saying. And I don't believe that. I agree there have been horrendous misapplications of the wish to redesign human nature. But on the other hand, the style which lets it just develop like an untended weedy lot has produced a fairly weedy lot of leaders. Uh, with no great uh, uh, apparent commitment to the salvation of the human race either. What it comes down to is responsibility. Politics without responsibility is fascism. And politics responsibly practiced is, uh, you know, the only other option available. All this goes back to this theme of the primacy of experience, recapturing the primary importance of yourself, first of all, and then your affinity group, the people around you. Um, McLuhan said that this would happen naturally, and I, from what I see over the past few years, it seems to me this is so, that he called it electronic feudalism and said that the nation state would dissolve under the impact of electronic media. He, his timetable was a little too short. This is really a problem for profits. Uh, but he was perfectly right. I mean, what happened in Tiananmen Square, what happened in Eastern Europe, was entirely the product of information technology just conveying images, just conveying images from the West dissolved the whole myth of Marxism, which relied on you know, a false view of reality. The thing is, these images are value neutral. They're corrosive wherever they move. The same forces that destroyed the Communist Party in Eastern Europe will destroy the ruling families of the Arabian Peninsula with equal ease, because what it is is it's an anti-oligarchic virus that has gotten loose in the language ocean of the planet. I mean, the thing that happened in Tiananmen Square, you could feel every government on Earth heave a sigh of relief when they got that under control, because the nightmare of every government on Earth is a million peaceable people assembled in the main square of your capital city demanding that you pack up for Switzerland. <laughs> I mean, that, that is it. And if it happens, if it happens in Bucharest, you go. If it happens in Tarania, you go. If it happens in Washington, you go. Nobody says no to a million people in the streets. That's what the Shah of Iran found out. I mean, he made a decree that if more than three people gathered in any place, they would be shot dead. The next day, two and a half million people marched screaming beneath his window for his head. You look, at a, you look at a scene like that and say, you know, hey, it's time to retrench. It's time to seriously cut a deal here. <clears throat> well, this is a long rambling answer to the question, you know, what is to be done? How can we make a difference? And I think the, the way that it's to be done is by uh, empowering individual discourse and... Uh, recognizing the power of the individual. Huge amounts of global civilization are operating on automatic pilot. You know, you think that if you were to walk into the World Trade Center or the Pentagon or NATO headquarters in Brussels, that there would be smart people furiously running things. 
there are idiots everywhere at every level of organization. I mean, if you were to attend a cabinet meeting, one guy will be asleep with his face in his plate. I swear, you know, it makes no difference. And we, the little people down in the labyrinthine streets of the city, looking up at the castle as the great ones come and go, you know, we believe that they're all about the fine business of humanity. But, you know, it's just a fiction. It's an absurdity. And uh, to the degree that we proclaim it so, the meme spreads. And, uh, and the, the dream of the oligarchs, the autocrats, the programmers is dissolved. This is why the psychedelic thing is so controversial, such political dynamite, because ultimately it dissolves the linguistic structures that it finds pre-existing, whatever they are. I really believe this. I mean, talking to shamans in the Amazon, ultimately, when you get to know them, they will tell you, you know, you think this is easy? You think because I am a Witoto? You think because I wear a gourd on my penis, I am somehow more able to do this than you are? No, every time I go, I know it may be the last time because it's so hard. It's so challenging to who I am. It always is. I mean, it's a real edge. It's not an edge that you go and map, and then the next time it's not an edge. It's that every time you go, you discover this edge. It's the great gift, the great challenge, the great miracle of human existence is that within each one of us, there is this dimension which we can choose to, to access, which is a constant challenge to our existential modality. You know, you don't have to mush your way up jungle rivers and rip jewels from the eyes of idols and uh, stuff like that. You can, on a Saturday evening, in the privacy of your own uh, living room, uh, become your own Magellan, and you are no less courageous than Magellan. And maybe Magellan is a bad example since he didn't make it all the way around. Uh, your own Columbus. Uh, and, and this dimension of freedom has always been 95% of what the human experience was about in terms of risk and thrills. And, uh, uh, religion is not, you know, the mumblings of men wearing dresses. It just isn't. Nor is it all of this philosophical mumbo-jumbo that arises out of rational discourse and brain uh, specialization. It's that somehow part of the package of being a living, thinking being is that you get a universe inside of you. You know, you get a galaxy-sized object inside you that you can access. And there, there are the mountains, the rivers, the jungles, the dynastic families, the ruins, the planets, the works of art, the poetry, the sciences, the magics of millions upon millions upon millions of worlds. And this is apparently who we each are. We're a little bit of eternity sticking into three-dimensional space and for some reason occupying time in a monkey body. But when you turn your eyes then inward, you discover the birthright, the, the existential facts out of which this particular existence emerged. And, you know, without going dewy-eyed, without lining up with all the uh, religious people, you st it's more real than religion, because it's apparently rooted in biology. And it's a great secret, a great secret and a great comfort, because it means, you know, mystery didn't die with the fall of Arthur or the fall of Atlantis or the fall of anything. Mystery is alive in the moment, in the here and now. It just simply lies on the other side of a barrier of courage 
And it isn't even that high a barrier. It just is a barrier high enough to keep out uh, the insincere and uh, the misdirected. But for those who will claim it, in the midst of the historical chaos of the late 20th century, they become the archaic pioneers. They become the first people to carry the Ouroboric serpent around to its own tail and to make a closure. And to the, to the degree that any one of us has this, uh, this connection back to the archaic in our life, it makes where we have been make a lot more sense, and it makes where we're going seem a lot more inviting, which it really is, I think. Well, that's all I have to say. I think we can probably, uh, it's a little early. Does anybody have any, anything they want to add? Yeah. We've been talking about the ego a lot and its dissolution and breaking through the boundaries of it. Uh, and it sometimes sounds like ego has a pejorative connotation. On the other hand, you've just been talking very briefly about the fact that it's up to each of us in our own unique individuation to claim what, what can be claimed and that even the small individual little ego can virtually change the world if it has the right place to stand. It seems like these... So how do you balance these things? Yeah, I just really the question is what is the future of the ego as we know it after say post 2012 will the ego really be more of a group ego or a transformation of our ego or is the ultimate goal to shed our egos completely and become some form of uh, individuation which we can't even dream about at this point well you're right there's a dynamic tension there sometimes when this comes up I answer it by saying, uh, you know, that you need an ego. If you didn't have an ego, you wouldn't know whose mouth to put food in when you have dinner with someone at a restaurant. <laughs> so ego is necessary to keep straight whose orifices are whose, and, and, and that's the main function of ego. But then, you know, there is a deeper level to it, Somehow, the way I imagine it is that the, the ego is, uh, the, the correct expression of ego is when there is ego present, but it is perceived as Tao. In other words, Tao is this state where you just go along and somehow get along. And ego is a state where you're somehow pushing the river, and that's how you get along. Uh, I think the ego of the future would be, will be much less possessive, and that it's the possessiveness, the projection of the um, domain, really, of the ego outside of itself, specifically the control of other people you know, sexual partners, children, parents. Uh, the way I imagine these, this pastoral situation of 12 or 15,000 years ago to work was uh, people simply had group values because the children were group-owned. And that was made such a tremendous difference in how the society imaged itself. People lived for the group and that the core of the group were the children and people always put them first. So uh, uh, everyone identified with the children, everyone was willing to face risk to preserve the core of young, the younger gene pool and, and that that was what made the difference. This concern for male paternity is really a poisonous factor. And uh, see, the, the, when you look at primatology generally, it's pretty clear that as a group of species, primates do tend to male dominance, that even the, even the, the apes and the squirrel monkeys and the New World primates in the wild, there's usually an alpha male that's dominant. So 
this symbiosis between human beings, cattle, and psychedelic plants that allowed the feminine to emerge was something that was emerging against the grain of primate organization. So really what has happened is we have returned to a more animal kind of existence. We are more like beasts than the people of 10, 15,000 years ago because they were uh, using psychedelics uh, to uh, artificially, you could say, or pharmacologically inflate feminine values. And this allowed them to become civilized people. I mean, I have a somewhat elaborate theory about this, but I think that women are responsible for the emergence of language because I think that the division of labor that we know went on very early because of the male's larger body size and the upper half of the body, that the males tended to specialize toward hunting. Hunting puts a premium on physical strength and stoicism meaning sitting a long time with your mouth shut, and then you have a limited number of commands. The, the women and bladder control is very important, where women fail that test. So, so then what the women were doing was they were specialized as gatherers of plants and roots and insects and stuff like that. Well, this is a tremendous pressure to develop descriptive taxonomy because gathering is the art of descriptive taxonomy. You want to know that you want, you know, the little bulbous root with the yellow flowers that grows down between the shattered granite boulders near the creek. It's all language, language, language. And the, d and the pressure is life and death. If you eat the wrong plant, you become very sick, or you abort your fetus, or you die. So those who were well able to describe the objects of the hunting gathering, of the gathering side of the economy, were quickly outbred those who weren't. And language may have even been a kind of secret ability of women at some point. You see, psilocybin synergizes language like bursts of activity and, and may have been the, the thing which set it over. But what happened in this woman situation with language is a good example of what often happens with cultural innovation. The women possessed all this knowledge about hunting, about the gathering of plants and the magical use and preparation of plants. But at a certain point, the database became so huge that it underwent a collapse conceptually. And some brilliant woman realized, we don't have to know about 600 plants and all these locations and seasonal variations and all this. We just have to concentrate on five plants and really learn all about those plants. And then we can dispense with all this stuff. And this was probably because in the nomadic cycle, they would encounter their own middens from the year before. And there, there would be cereal grains sprouted, and you quickly put it together. But the specialization represented by agriculture, that was the beginning of the end, as far as I'm concerned. Because at that point, there was retraction away from nature. It was no longer about letting nature guide you to gather and find what you needed. It was the, a kind of paranoid, a kind of rip-off attitude. It was, you know, let us exploit these five plants. This means tilling the ground. It means the end of nomadism, because now we're going to settle in one place, and we're going to redirect the flow of water, and we're going to uh, become agriculturalists. It's an entirely different psychology. Weston Labar said that psychedelic shamanism died when it became important to get up in the morning and go out and hoe the corn. And then people replaced the psychedelic gods with the gods of wheat and corn. The, the Tammuz, the corn god of ancient Babylon, then appears. And 
gods of agriculture and male pat and male dominance go hand in hand. The previous religion at the edge of the high Neolithic was this religion of the great horned goddess, and it was a religion of nomadic pastoralism, orgiastic sexual, you know, activity, uh, psychedelic drugs, and uh, and tremendous emphasis on cattle. Cattle were the great bridge to all these concepts. We start out as a baboon-like creature wandering behind these herds of ungulate cattle. I've seen baboons do this in Kenya, flipping over cow pies, looking for carrion beetle grubs as a source of fat and protein. But then, uh, you know, we went from predation on carrion, the kills of larger animals, to slowly actually domesticating these things. And the milk and the blood and the manure and the meat and the mushroom would all be seen to be things which came quite naturally from the cow. The cow was like this supreme feminine symbol. And all over North Africa and the ancient Middle East, uh, you get this Paleolith late Paleolithic great horned goddess. The cattle religion and the emergence of consciousness seem to go uh, hand in hand. One time I was waiting for a load of mushrooms to come on, and uh, it was very strong. It was I had sort of miscalculated, and I had gotten too much, and I could see this thing just coming at me, huge force, and uh, I heard a voice. It was actually the Swiss air stewardess from Federico Fellini's Eight and a Half, <laughs> but it was that voice, and she said, uh, they say it helps to lay down, cowboy. <laughs> and I was amused at the time, or later when I had time to be amused, I was amused. But then I realized this mode of address, cowboy, is probably typical of the mushroom because for most, 95% of its existence, most of what it's dealt with are cowboys and cowgirls <laughs> because these are the people who follow along behind the cows. These are the people who invented astrology from watching the stars. And many people, myself included, have reported the experience of looking at the stars stoned on psilocybin and having the mushrooms supply dotted lines between the constellations. I mean, says, there it is, there's the map. Uh, um, yes, pastoralists, herders, they invented the calendar from watching the horizon. And you know, what we looked at last night was partially a calendar. It's very interesting if you look, if you want a meditation on shamanism, politics, time, and so forth. Look at hexagram 49 in the I Ching, which is revolution. And you might go to this expecting a treatise on political upheaval. And it says, instead, uh, the magician is a calendar maker. He measures the seasons and sets them right. And it's this idea of reconstruction of time. The message that I get out of the psychedelics is that, the, that we need to reframe the largest frames in our linguistic cosmology. It means reformation of the calendar, reformation of language, that we cannot evolve any faster than the languages that we are imprisoned within. We are linguistic creatures somehow. And so we, we need strategies, catalysts, enzymes, whatever it is, practices that force the evolution of language along conscious lines. If we don't do this, the old styles of thinking, the old concepts are just going to pull us down. Well, to my mind, that this makes psychedelics central 
to any political reconstruction because psychedelics are the only force in nature that actually dissolves linguistic structure, lets the mechanics of syntax be visible, allows the possibility for the introduction, rapid introduction and spread of new concepts, gives permission for new ways of seeing. And this is what we have to do. We have to change our minds. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed this.